Amen. Choir, thank you so very much. Uh, I don't know if anybody else in the room needed that. I sure needed that. Thank you so very much. And Katrina, thank you for what you do. And yeah, Jonathan, I think we'll keep you around. Yep. Just just a, like a whole lot longer. Absolutely. <laughs> well, church, good morning. Open your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 13. Because this morning we're looking at an obstacle turned blessing. An obstacle turned blessing. Because through the life of Abram and soon to be Abraham, we're going to see how God uses the circumstances that he goes through in his life to bring God glory, but also to teach us as well. Because Abram is, he's a father in the faith to us. He's viewed as, as the father of the nation of Israel. We as believers, as Christians, you know what? We are the new tribe of Israel. You realize that? We're the Christian tribe. Now, don't try to find us anywhere in the Bible. We're not in there. Well, we're in the book of Acts, and you can look that up. But now, through Abram, we have become heirs to the promise of, of God through his faith and the example he gives us in his word. If you're open to Genesis chapter 13, let's begin in chapter 1, but I'm going to have uh, chapter 5, uh, actually chapter 8, up on the screen here in a little bit. Let's start in the first verse of Genesis chapter 13. The Bible says this, Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he, his wife, and all he had, and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. He went by stages from the Negev to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had formerly been, to the site where he had built an altar. And Abram called on the name of the Lord there. Verse 5. Now Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together. For they had so many possessions they could not stay together. 
And there was quarreling between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at the time, the Canaanites and the Pezerites were living in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go right. If to the right, then I will go left. God has delivered Abram out of Egypt, and and they've gone out, Lot and, and him together, and the Bible says they both amassed a great amount of wealth. Now, we remember, church, do we not, that when God called Abram to leave his homeland in Ur of the Chaldees, what did Abram leave with? It's okay to say it, nothing. He left everything behind to follow God, to be obedient to what God had called him to do. He left his inheritance. He left his possessions. He left his father's house, which was the source of inheritance and wealth that you would inherit someday. And he went out with nothing. Now, I heard it said before, and, and, and I can see the perspective here, that, that from the beginning, Lot failed his first test. Or Abram failed his first test because Lot went with him. God told Abram, Abram, leave everything behind, leave your household, your relatives, everything, and go into the land where I will show you. Well, Lot tags along with his uncle, Abram. In Egypt... Abram says that his wife, Sarai, is really his sister, and we understand it was his half-sister, but we also understand last week that a half-truth is really a whole lie. Abram failed that second test. Again, an obstacle to overcome. I think he fell short. But now we see here in Genesis chapter 18, I feel that Abram passes this test with flying colors. Because there's an obstacle before him now, and it's the wealth and possessions that he has amassed that God has blessed him with, and God has also blessed Lot as well. And the Bible here says that the land in which they were in was too great to support the wealth, the herds, the flocks that both Abram and Lot had, and they came to an impasse. It's a simple matter, folks, of geography. God had blessed them both. They needed to separate. Do you know what? Abram passes this test because for him, relationship was more important than riches. Listen to that, church. Relationship should always be more important than riches because do you love riches and use people or do you love people and use riches? You know what? Every single one of us has been blessed by God. It doesn't matter if you're on food stamps or you own the food company. God has called you to use what he has given you for his glory. And if we remember the story of the widow in the New Testament, when Jesus is looking at the people coming and giving their altar, their, their offerings before the altar and, and the temple, Jesus commends the widow that gave the, the might the smallest of currencies. And other people who went before her gave large amounts of money. Jesus says, you know, compared to all of these, this one widow has given everything. So it's not the size of your pocketbook that God's concerned with. It's what you do with it. It's what you do with it. And church, I believe Abram passed the test with flying colors. What does Scripture say? Let's look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Paul to the Philippians says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, or with humility consider others better. Regard others as more important than yourself. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I believe if God's word says it, that settles it, and we obey it. If scripture says consider others better and in a mindset of humility to look out for others' interests before our own, I believe we should be doing that. I believe it's true. James also points this out to us in, in chapter 3 and verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. You know, church, someday I'd love to do a, a sermon series on, on the other 316s of the Bible. I wonder what that may hold. But here James says it so perfectly where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. Abram had a choice to make. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe he chose relationship over riches because when it came time to choose, Abram gave the first choice over to his nephew, Lot. Now, as head of the family, Abram could have made the decision. He could have said, all right, Lot, you're going to go this way, and I'm going to go that way. See you later. But instead, Abram comes to his nephew and he says, look, let there not be any disagreement between us. Folks, our relationships in your life, relationships with your earthly biological family or your spiritual body, are they important enough to you that you come to your brother or sister and you say, look, let there be no disagreement between us? I think it's why God says in his word, preserve unity, fight for it. Contend for it. Don't give up so easily in letting discord come between you as a body of Christ. Abram said, relationship lot is more important to me than what I've got, and you're more important to me than my riches, so let's make an agreement right now. I'm going to give you the choice of the land. Whichever way you choose to go, I'm going to go the other way. Because God's in control and God has blessed us. In verse 10 of Genesis 13, Lot chooses the best for himself. Let's look at this, church. Verse 10. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zor. So Lot chose for himself the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. And Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the, cities, in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now, I want to show you a few pictures, church, of, of where Lot and Abram were, what they saw, and what each one of them chose. We can throw that first picture up there. This is the picture of the Valley of Jordan. Now, I know we have a few farmers here. I know we have a few horsemen here. You don't have to be either to look at this picture and say, hmm, can I grow some crops there? Can I take care of some livestock there? I see lots of water. I see lots of fields. I see lots of irrigation. Wow, not bad. This, again, church, this is the valley of the Jordan. This is what Lot chose. Now, let me show you the land of Canaan that Abram chose. Huh. I see some water. Okay. Not, not too bad. Um, what do you see up here, here, church? I see hills. Do you see any nice green pastures there to be able to graze your cattle or your sheep? How easy is it going to be to run a tractor on some of these things? I see a few of you laughing at me. I, I, I know we're going where we should be going. Look at the bottom part of the picture here. I see rocks. 
Church, if you had a choice between choosing in this picture, go back to the, the other one real quick, Lena, or that. Church, let me ask you, where were Abram's priorities? What was Abram thinking about in regards to his family? Church, this is his family. I think we have lost the importance of family in our concept, in our modern day mindset. We have lost the idea of family in our church culture sometimes. Gosh, I want us to get back to it again to say, you know what? Let there be no discord between us at all. If you want to choose that, fine. You go that way. I'll go the other way. Because you know what? God is the individual that we must please and not ourselves. Church, when you find yourself pleasing yourself over the will of God, you will find you will always come up bankrupt. Always. Lot chose relationship over riches. This was an obstacle that was before him. And he said, you know what? God, I want this to be an opportunity for me to do what's right. You know, God will bring obstacles through your life. He will bring difficulties and situations through your life. It, it is a test, first of all, to grow your faith. Second of all, to see what kind of faith you're standing on. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we have God's word as our standard. We have God's word as the pavers and the brick and the mortar and the steel and the concrete to stand upon. God says, what will you choose this day? Which direction are you going to go, right or the left? Are you going to make the first choice or are you going to give that choice up to others? Church, we will never fail when we choose God's direction. Never. And it's right here in his word. Let's look at this opportunity that was turned blessing. Let's look at this. Verse 14 of Genesis 13 says this. Now the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look. This is when Abram had taken the direction of Canaan, and he was looking at the hills and the difficulties and the rocks and the little bitty spots where he might try to eke out some type of field for his flocks. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Look northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. Church, God appears to Abram when he makes a decision to value relationship. God places his stamp of approval on Abram's decision, and he appears to Abram and speaks to him. You know, church, one of the main things that I want you to, to, to get a hold of here in, this, in this, these verses, when God speaks to you and you hear his voice, and Scripture says that, he, that you can hear his voice. It's a voice that... Your mind understands and your heart hears. When you hear God's voice, that is God's invitation for you to join together to worship him there because God has just spoken to you. We forget the gravity of the situation. When God shows up and speaks, it's not like going through the drive through that breaks. It's not like pressing a button and saying hello on your phone. This is the God of the universe who's choosing to enter into our world and speak to his children. 
I love it when I'm having a chance to talk to some folks in the church and a godly woman or a godly man or, 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 a, or a young person, a student will say, you know what? I feel God spoke to me and said this or this and this and this. I always stop and I say, did you get that? I have to admit, it wasn't me who brought this to my attention. It was my wife. So one day when I told her, I said, hey, I think God spoke to me. She said, David, did you get that? God spoke to you and you heard his voice. If you're here and you haven't heard God's voice in a long time, let me encourage you to pick up his word and be reading his word. He can speak to you so clearly through it. It's one of the most perfect ways to hear the voice of God because God reveals himself in his scriptures. God overcame the problem of geography and Abram's descendants would be throughout the earth and they would be blessed and he would have descendants that would be as numerous as the dust of the earth. I had the opportunity one time to ask a gentleman in, in the church I pastored back in Oklahoma and I said, uh, I said, Bill, would you calculate for me how much one of our communion cups will hold in sand. Bill's a gentleman in our church. He loved mathematics. He loved all kinds of problems like this. And he said, okay, Pastor, I'll, I'll do that. And he calculated one time, if I can get my figure straight, uh, about a million eight hundred thousand grains of sand in a communion cup. Then I asked him, I said, well, Bill, can you calculate for me how many communion cups would fill our church? And that number, church, was mind-blowing. And God says here that your descendants will be as the dust of the earth. If I am not too mistaken, I believe dust is a little finer than sand. Although when the windy season comes up, I love looking at the weather forecast at Alamogordo and seeing the white sand blow from New Mexico all the way to uh, the East Coast. That to me is so awesome. I think we're depositing New Mexico all over the world. Yeah. God says your descendants will be so numerous, they'll be as the dust of the earth. And if you could number that much, that's how much they would be. That is a pretty awesome blessing. Is it not? Do you realize, church, that we are the fulfillment of this verse? You got it right here in church, April 29th, 2018, Belen, New Mexico. God is fulfilling his promise that he gave to Abram thousands of years ago today. Because Scripture says this in Galatians 3, 7 through 9, then understand that those who have Faith are Abraham's sons. Now the scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abram. Abram. Saying all the nations will be blessed through you so that those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. Church, we are the fulfillment of this promise. And when Abram made the decision to value relationship over his riches, God blessed him so much that we can't even begin to imagine. All I know is it's true. And we can celebrate that this morning. The children of Abraham are those who are children by faith. Not just his biological descendants, but the children of Abraham that God is talking about, that Jesus died for, are those who are children by faith. When we, by faith, do what is right, God blesses. God will take care of you. He will bless you. Listen to this, Psalms 115 and verse 13. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. 1 Samuel 2, second half of verse 30, but now the Lord declares, far be it for me, for those who honor me, I will honor, 
and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Psalms 50 and verse 23, whoever sacrifices a thank offering honors me, and whoever orders his conduct, I will show him the salvation of God. Church, there is a blessing. There is a blessing beyond description for those who follow God and those who honor him. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Do you ever imagine sometimes that, that as the choir is singing, as we're joining together with, with them in praise, that God is here? You know he's here right now? Yes, Lord. Be welcome in this place, O oh God. For we honor you with our hearts. And we worship you with our souls, our spirit. All that we have, all that we are, oh God, we bless you. We honor you. Whoever sacrifices a thank offering honors me. Whoever orders his conduct, I will show him my salvation. Church, how about a wonderful way to worship God right now? Through the keeping of his commandments and in celebrating and observing the Lord's Supper. I'd like to ask if our deacons would come down right now. Church, we're going to offer God thanks. We're going to follow what he has said in his word. Because he says, whenever you eat of this communion, you do it in remembrance of me. So now let's celebrate together. The Bible says that Jesus took his disciples into the upper room and they were sharing a meal together. And at a certain time during that meal, Jesus stopped. And he set aside bread and wine and he turned the focus of the disciples to to a new reality that whenever they celebrated the meal they were to do it and they were to remember him and they were to pray together they were to, to worship together and this morning we as his disciples we as the believers of faith we're going to celebrate this Lord's Supper together. And we're going to remember Christ's death, his burial, but then his resurrection on the third day. As the elements come by, there are two cups there that are in the same, same slot. Go ahead and take both of them, because you will need both.
The Bible says that Jesus took bread and he blessed it as he prayed. He broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body. The Bible says, likewise, Christ also took the cup and he gave thanks. Amen. He gave it to them and he said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I will not drink again from this fruit of the vine and from now until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Then scripture says, after singing a hymn, they went out. So, do we have a hymn? <laughs> Amen. Bless that wonderful name. That wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus.
Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Come and have lunch with us, please, over at the Ministry Activity Center. God bless.